Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast, produced by City Current and brought to you by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. This show shares personal stories and insight from those who are giving back and making a difference so we can learn and do the same. We cover life lessons, business advice, passion, and purpose. Now here's our host, the CEO of City Current, Jeremy Park. Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We have a fun treat with someone who's in town here in Memphis, so we get to have her on sharing her story, Homeless to Harvard, her best-selling book, Breaking Night, as well. So we're in for a treat with our good friend, Liz Murray. Liz, welcome to Memphis again. So you, you, you've, you. you've kind of created a second home here. We'd like to say yeah. that we're adopting you to become a Memphian, but uh, how are you doing, Liz? Uh, good. I'm honored that you would say that, Jeremy. It's good to see you again. I know I keep coming back. I've been trying to explain it to my friends in New York. They go, what do you live there now? And, um, you know, that wouldn't be so bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. It's, it's really good to be back. Well, and even in full disclosure, we're here at uh, Michael and Alice Drake's house. So you're a house guest uh, here in Memphis as well. But for starters, h- how do you like Memphis? When, when your friends say, hey, how is Memphis? What do you tell them about Memphis? Wow. Uh, well, you know, New Yorkers think that New York City is the center of the universe. So it really doesn't matter what you tell them. <laughs> but, but for me personally, uh, well, I... So I think that when I first came here, I didn't expect to be hit so hard. And you were there. You saw it when I first came and visited. There's something about the history that's here that's so alive. Actually, my son, my eight-year-old son on the airplane on the way over last night asked me, what is it about Memphis, mom? You always talk about Memphis. And I said, I don't know, honey. I think that there's so much of our uh, really important history from our country, it, and it's alive there in a way that is not just from the past, but it, it's alive very much, and the lessons are there for us to learn today, right? And I think that in many ways, Memphis gets my heart because things that happened here are still unfolding all around us, and the question is, will we learn the lessons, right, or not? And Memphis feels like it's holding up that history for us, and I, I plus also the relationships I've developed here. I, f- I don't know how common it is in different areas of the country, but in this area, I keep meeting people who are starting nonprofits, changing lives. So there's this intersection of history and social movement. And so I feel drawn here and I keep coming back. Social movement, social justice, those are two big themes for you. We'll talk about a second book. Um, but I think that's also, too, why we love having you, but also, too, I, I think that's kind of why it resonates. You came and spoke here a couple of years ago, and that kicked off this relationship where you shared yeah. your story. You do a ton of public speaking all around uh, the world, sharing your homeless to Harvard story, but it's so much more than that. Let's start, though, for some context for listeners, sharing a little bit of the homeless to Harvard story. And obviously, you do share this all over, so we won't dive too deep into it because we want to talk about what you're doing now as a change maker. But give us a little bit of your story growing up in the Bronx, in New York, sure. kind of carry us through a little bit of your childhood. Okay, I'll do that. And then I'll also do that as a way to give deeper context into me being in Memphis and then sort of what's next, because all those intersect really nicely you know, with when I came here to speak that first time, as you mentioned, right? So I came here to speak because I sort of in this very Forrest Gump kind of fashion ended up doing public speaking in my life. Why did that happen was because I I have a story that most people, if they've seen it, whether it's this very sentimental lifetime television movie they made about my life called From Homeless to Harvard, or they may have seen my book, Breaking Night, I had this journey that is exactly what it sounds like. I was born in the Bronx. I was raised by parents who, I don't, people seem to be for some reason very surprised when I say that they were loving, but they were also very drug addicted. So I was raised in, I would say, abject poverty from the North American urban perspective. We grew up, my sister and I, without enough food in the fridge. Our parents were shooting up. Drug needles were out on the kitchen counter most of the time. My parents were loving, but they struggled quite a bit. And, you know, they grew up in that whole 70s disco era, but it kind of went wrong. And my sister and I, I always say that we we were what happened when in the aftermath of when the party was over. So their addiction shaped our lives. And when it came to things like going to school, dreaming of a future for myself, I didn't, when I was very young, understand that I belonged as part of society And I think a big piece of that was seeing that my parents hadn't found inroads to the larger world around them. You know, when you sit on your mother's lap when you're a kid and she has to do things like requalify for welfare, right? And you know that she has to get all her paperwork absolutely perfect and the caseworker across the desk 
will either approve or not approve. And depending on that, you will get food or you won't, right? And growing up with hundreds of those interactions in one fashion or another, you internalize some messages from that. And it took me a long time to realize that watching my parents have no authority in the world and not really being a, a part of it in any successful way by many measures, then I grew up feeling as though, okay, well, I'm just going to live in this little block, in this little apartment with right. not much going on. And in a sense that there's this wall and society is over here and then people like us are somehow less and we're over here. And I grew up with that kind of psychology and became chronically truant from school and fell behind. And, and yet there was all this adversity and the fridge was empty and my sister and I were banging on our neighbor's doors asking for food and that was all true. But there was also a lot of love. And I like to really stress that if I share my background with people, I think people tend to see it as either good or bad. And I always tell people the good and the bad happen side by side. My mom used to sit at the foot of my bed and you know, share her dreams with me and tuck me in and sing to me like any mom. Mm -hmm. She was very loving. And then she'd go get high. You know, and my dad would take me to the library, help me fall in love with books. Uh, you know, and then never return any of the books to the library. <laughs> you know, a few, I always say, you know, he had a few aliases at the New York Public Library, right? <laughs> so I was encouraged in certain ways and loved, but there just was never enough. And I grew up in that kind of psychology. So, well, and I like the fact that you say it, it's not one or the other, they all are together, right? Sure. And so you can experience one side, but still feel loved. And you might not have the role modeling, but there's still love. And you as a child don't think anything less in the sense of, oh, wait a second, I'm I'm in poverty or whatever else. You just know this is this is my life. This is what I'm dealing with. And so um, a, a lot of that is just how you kind of process things, but what you're exposed to. And I think for children, especially, um, you know, you can't be what you can't see or whatever spin you want to put on it is. If you don't see those things, you can't understand, wait a second, I can be that. So you only know what's in your world. And so sure. to your point, you're only kind of looking geographically, well, I'll be this in my neighborhood. Right. And I think at some point then it clicks. And especially on your end, um, it's a sad story, but losing your mother mm -hmm. really does change your trajectory on the way you look at your own life and taking things into your hand. Share yes. a little bit of that story. Sure. Well, I want to make sure I address something you just said, and then I'd like to go right into that. Yeah. One is... When we say, I want to be careful with saying that there's no role modeling and maybe not for a career, but when you have loving parents, uh, that's role modeling. Sure. So yeah. there's not a lack of it. And I always want to say that because I work with youth today and I very often will hear people say, we almost speak about as a culture, as a society, we speak about youth who happen to have been made poor and made vulnerable. We speak about them as though there's sort of nothing there, but then one day they're going to get to the good place, right? And actually there's a lot of strength and resilience in those situations, just as when I would later on find myself at Harvard, my roommate had a lot of money and there was success in her family by a lot of measures. And yet the abuse was there and neglect is neglect. Alcoholism is alcoholism. Her parents had those issues. So I want to always make sure that we say that it's not that there's no role modeling, but in terms of belonging mm. in the world at large, how do I navigate a career? What's the relevance of my elementary school education to my middle school, to my high school, right. to my career that you're absolutely right was missing. So, um, you know, so I grew up without that and that change that you mentioned, that turning point, I would say right before my mother passed away, there's one critical thing to mention was just that despite everything I just told you, I also had a, an upstairs neighbor by the name of Arthur who was very sweet. He, we called him uncle Arthur. I know now based on the work I do. And as an adult, I can look back and say, Arthur might've been my first mentor, you know, and Arthur was a neighbor who I like to say, I, so I used to cut school. I'm going to give you a really specific example. It didn't go. Now, most of my neighbors would see me not going to school because I would sit on the stoop with a handball or something. And they kind of look, you know, a 10 year old child should not be sitting on the stoop in the middle of the day in the Bronx. Right. Right. But what could people do? They had their own lives. They kept going. I always tell people Arthur was the one who didn't look away. You know, he saw me. Hey, you know, and, and he knew he had an intuition like you don't go up and why aren't you in school? He's can I play that handball with you? And he's very close friends with my mother. He was like her brother. So what, what shows do you like? What books do you read? And he began asking and inquiring and showing a real curiosity and passion. He earned your trust. Yeah. I mean, there, I was real to him. 
And I, I think that was big. I think that's big for anyone, but really for a kid. So pretty soon, you know, he'd knock on the door when we had no food and our parents had gotten high and fallen asleep, like cooked noodles on the couch, you know, and they, he'd come in and he'd see there was no food. He'd bring a big pot of food. He and his girlfriend lived right upstairs. He, he would take me into the hallway sometimes. Why don't you come out here? I see them using, let's bring your homework and you want this plate of food. Now you're going to have to do your homework while we eat it. And slowly, very slowly for a few years, right around that middle school age, he had me, I would say, learn a few key lessons slowly though, right? Because I wasn't buying it at first. He'd listen to me as though I was saying the most interesting in the world. Like I was Plato, right? I'm 11 years old. But but what he would do is go, you know, you're so interesting. I, I know that one day you're going to help a lot of people. I know one day you're going to get there and, you know, you just got to do your homework. You just got to get to school. And I'd look at him like he was, you know, nuts. He caught me cutting school a couple of years later. He put me in the car. He had an old Dodge where... <laughs> It was so rotten and so old. You know, the Flintstones where your feet go through. Like he actually, Arthur's car, I'm not even kidding. There was cardboard. And if you lifted it, you would see the street. (laughs) But I was driving in that old Dodge and we were going to school and he would look at me because I was, you know, busted. But he'd go, well, you're going to change so many people's lives. I can't, you know, of course, you you know, you have to go to school to do that, Liz. But I'm so excited that I get to drive you there. Because, you know, I'm looking at this man. You are out So of he's always mind, pouring right? positive so energy into you. You have to see the progression of that over time. Because I, I now understand that people will grow into the conversations that you create around them. And there's something in the way you hold and, and curate and cultivate a conversation around a person. You are so loving, Liz. And I'm going to give you a really specific example. And then I'm going to go to that turning point you asked. So... So how do you forgive your parents when they are using drugs and not filling the refrigerator? Okay. Like that's complex. And, and how do you take care of yourself? What is your attitude and orientation toward that? How does that not traumatize you for life? So my mother one day took the last $5 I had. I was a kid. I was, I want to say 11. She went out and copped a bag. She bought drugs and I generally was very reserved. I would never say a mean thing to her, but that day I did. I said a lot of mean things to her. I won't repeat them here. They're hard to think about now. She was putting the syringes across the tabletop. She snatched the needle. She was, you know, going to go, okay, leave me alone, Lizzie. Um, She called me Lizzie. I'm going to get high. Um, I continued to escalate. And then all of a sudden she snatches all those tools she needed to get high. She went down the hallway far end to go to the bathroom. And in my mind, I think she's trying to run away from me. So I follow her and I keep going. And then when I get to the bathroom, I realize that actually what's going on is that she was flushing the drugs down the toilet and she was actually crying. And she looked at me and said, Lizzie, you know, I'm not a monster, sweetheart. I don't know how to stop. I love you more than my own life. I don't know what to do, honey. And we end up on the bathroom floor crying together. I bring this to Arthur and he just looks at me. He goes, you know, Liz, uh, people can't give you what they don't have. You know, and your mom's schizophrenic. She's legally blind. People can't give you what they don't have. Boy, when you walk into a room, she looks like the sun just rose the way she looks at you. And there's something about that, Jeremy, I don't know how to explain it, but going forward as time passed, the possibility of blame and and the accountability is critically important, but blame as a, as a place to dwell and a destination is very toxic. And I came to understand that two things could be true at the same time. Maybe I can be deeply loved at this person's capacity, but also that capacity is limited. So the takeaway was... Um, well, maybe I'm going to have to be responsible for myself. And that was a huge thing because later on, I just had a very tough, very, very tough adolescence where I did eventually lose my mother. She died due to her addiction leading to HIV AIDS. It's before they have the medication they have now. But much to my surprise, Arthur died that year as well. Nine months before my mother died, he was not an addict. He just, we didn't know he had a heart condition and he died very suddenly. He died, my mother died, and then I had this moment in my life over those months, like bookends their deaths that year. I was 15 when he passed. I just turned 16 when she passed. You know, you start to reflect on life. Any one of your listeners listening right now, you know, and if I get to be in front of an audience, I always look for the faces. I look for who, have you lost someone who you love so much? They were like, constellations, right? They were a North star in your life and they're gone. And it changes your relationship to the world. And I think there's a moment right after a loss that deep where you can almost recalibrate your relationship to your own life. And that's exactly what happened. 
I found myself for the months after sleeping over my friends' houses, going to, you know, um, you know, sleeping in their hallways. They would bring me food at night. If in New York City, there's so many buildings where if you go right up before the rooftop, and the alarm, if it doesn't go off, you can sleep up there. And so friends would bring me food. I had lost my home. My father was in a homeless shelter. We lost our apartment. Like everything went wrong, right? But I would be in these situations. And, you know, the thing is, when someone pours love into you that way, it lasts a lifetime. Because my friends are all around me. People are getting high. They're dropping out of school. A number of things are happening. All of them are possible options for me. And yet this little voice inside was like, you know what? You really have to get yourself to school. You're going to change people's lives. You know, you've got somewhere to go. And I don't know how to explain this to you, Jeremy, but there was just something about, I suppose I internalized it. I want to say to people that if you're ever in front of a person who's vulnerable, whether it's your own child, or maybe you're in a profession of leadership, you're bringing up emerging leaders who are looking to you. Do you believe in me? You know, can I do it? Sometimes I think each of us comes to a place where we need someone else to see who we could be before we can believe it. Mm -hmm. And if you have enough of that going on, it may not have the returns right that moment, but you give it a little time because right then and there, instead of just dropping out and giving up, yeah, I decided to go back to school. I went back. I found a great, a great high school. I did not tell them I was homeless. I hid my homelessness from them, gave them a friend's address, and I cried my tears, and there were plenty, but I doubled down really hard, and I just asked this big question, right, which I think is a question for each and every one of us. Um, if you feel stuck, does it have to remain that way, or can it be different? And I know it's a very simple question, but, you know, if you, if you pause, you can notice sometimes that if we're not careful, just how repetitive every day gets it, it can almost like um, repetition changes the size of things. Like it can make you think this is what life is. But instead, what if it was possible, like right this moment to say, well, what if I made up something else? Right. So I went back to school while I was homeless. I doubled my courses because I was far behind everyone else. Mm -hmm. I decided to get straight A's. And I thought I would make these goals kind of come what may. And, and that's exactly what I did. I didn't think I would end up with some very sentimental like, lifetime movie here. <laughs> that was not what was in my head. <laughs> well, but it shows the power of the human spirit. It obviously mm -hmm. the hero's journey of overcoming the adversity and all the lessons that, you know, so many that you've learned, some of which obviously you're sharing, but it's like, it's a powerful story. I think that inspires others to realize no matter what you're going through, because in many cases, especially look at what, how much you've gone through, um, you can still, you can still do great things with our, with your life. And I think there's, there's power in just that purpose. Give me, you know, one thing and it could be with Arthur, it could be with your mom and dad, but just a happy memory that stands out. Oh yeah. It's great. I mean, thank you for asking that question. You know, people, no, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. People want to know like this, only the, the sad is very important, but the good stuff too. Um, you know, my dad used to pick the garbage and when I was a kid, so we're from New York City and we're from the Bronx and you can take the train for not that long. And suddenly you're in the middle of all those famous areas in Manhattan that are in all those movies. And under those buildings where there's a lot of wealth, my dad would go to the garbage pile. And I know this sounds really, you said a happy memory, but I don't, the word happy for me, it's more like what was a powerful and I laugh, a memory I laugh yeah, at yeah. is something it I'm going to respond a smile with. On face, yeah. So my dad would he'd wait for furniture day on garbage day, right? So he would go, which is to say you throw away larger items and he would go to the buildings that were very wealthy and he would go to whatever they threw out that was larger than a trash bag. And typically there were some things in there that were actually quite expensive. So I remember being absolutely humiliated when I was maybe 10 and he's picking through the trash in such a way and kind of cursing to himself and slamming things around. And these people on the sidewalk are walking a wide circle around the crazy man going through the trash. But he found this like keyboard in front of me and every week there was like something and he'd give, and he saw people staring at him and he turned to me and he said, Lizzie, <laughs> and he pointed to all the people staring at him. I won't repeat exactly what he said. Don't you ever give a, that what anyone thinks about what you should be doing, about what you're, you shouldn't be doing. He said, you decide for yourself what you want to do. It's all made up anyway. <laughs> I was like, okay, Dad. You know, and I, of course, I was still humiliated. Right, right. As right, a kid, but, yeah. But I remembered later on in life, there were so many moments where I would see a crowd of people walking in one direction, and I would go, I wonder if there's a shorter line. 
I wonder if there's a back door around here. I wonder if there's another way. And there was, it came to me in a very unusual sense, but I was raised by a dad who taught me it's all made up, make up something you want to make up. I was raised by a mom who loved me more than life itself and told me I was worthy. And I was raised by an uncle, a mentor, frankly, who said, you are going to change people's lives. We were broke. We didn't have food in the fridge, but we had each other. And as far as I see, you know, that means you, you have everything. So I, I, I don't come from this deficit-based perspective necessarily. I think there's beauty in where we all come from. What's funny is just thinking like my dad, he used to always embarrass me, but he'd always say, they don't pay my bills. It's like kind of the same thing. Like, you know, I'm going to do what I want to do because they don't pay my bills. Is like he from the Bronx too? Yeah. yeah. I say you kind of had that you know, like, similar yeah. attitude where it's That's like, true. in some cases you just have to know yourself and right. say, this is the goal that I'm after and right. I'm going to do it my they way. They don't pay and- my bills. And it's all the all it's all made up is like a key distinction there because look, it came to me because he was picking like rancid trash on the street. But at the same time, the man made up his own reality. And, and and the ability to look at the way things as they supposedly are and to say, well, what if what if it's not what if they say it's that way, that it is that way? And what if there's another way? Yeah. Yeah. So carry that forward from so Harvard and then Columbia. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about what education means to you now, because, sure. you know, obviously, Growing up, as you mentioned, education wasn't necessarily the priority because skipping school and all of a sudden it clicks and education becomes a priority. But now when you look at Harvard and Columbia, education really has been a game changer for your life. Sure. Talk about what education means to you now. I mean, the meaning of education has so radically been transformed in my life and maybe not in the way that someone would think. You know, I got to this progressive high school right off the streets and I want to be very clear that the only reason I get to talk with you today is not only because I was so determined I did all these things, but after all the things I told you, I was also helped by teachers. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing is that, you know, when you grow up really marginalized, I'm sure there's other ways this can occur, but the result of that sometimes is when you go to get your education, you're being taught by human beings who don't look like the people from your neighborhood. They don't necessarily speak that way. They don't laugh at the same things. And the material on the board is not in any real way related to your daily life or how any adult around you survives. So in a sense, becomes what feels like an irrelevant charade or a monotonous obligation. And that's very dangerous because it leads to disengagement. What I now know, though, is not only was education a way to have a rich ecosystem of relationships around me with my guidance counselor, my peers. I mean, I married my husband. I met him in high school. So I'm going to say you can definitely meet people that (laughs) will last uh, for your whole life. But now in my life, I, I, it's not necessarily that it's Harvard or Columbia or these big name schools. I've gotten an incredible education, not only in those institutions, which I, of course I did and I'm grateful, but traveling around the country as a speaker and a workshop facilitator and going into, I, at this point, I've been speaking for a long time and I've gone to all 50 states and I've worked with people who they usually bring me in to do keynote addresses for organizations that are changing uh, key social issues in the area. So what does that mean? That means that I get to hear how people are defining problems and how they're proposing solutions. And I'm in the middle of those conversations and trying to translate between stakeholders and those things. And that's happened for a long time. That is the richest education that I could have gotten because little did I know, I was going to be called on to speak in these settings because people perceive that I'm a bootstrapper. People perceive that I'm a living, breathing example, that the American dream is alive and well and viable. And yet the country, there's a lot of struggles going on. So my my position in that has been rich and interesting. And now I know that education and the meaning of it, wherever your education comes from, there's many ways to get an education. But But really what it does is it helps you understand the context of the life that you were born into. And that what you thought was so particular to you is actually universal to the whole society around you. And that there's, um, it empowers you to realize, to lift you up out of the place in which you were born as a unique standalone thing and helps you fundamentally see what you have in common with everyone around you. And also to help you define social issues in a way that is much more literate, right? So you can actually know why these things are happening, right? you know, and when you can realize that, then you can be empowered to change them. I know that uh, it, it is a piece of the second book, but talking about your experience going, you know, from one reality to Harvard and Columbia and that stark contrast of, you know, basically from the Bronx to Harvard, mm-hmm. that's a reality check. And to your point, even just 
understanding, you know, the relevance of what you're learning at Harvard versus how it applies to a world from the Bronx, that's a big piece of, of just navigating change throughout. Um, carry that though, that idea now to what you're doing with the Arthur project. And I think, and I want you to describe the Arthur project too, because there is some, some, um, homage there to Arthur, obviously, and what he meant to your life. And so this is a part of that legacy of you making a difference and going back to him, believing in you, making a difference. It's kind of a cool full circle there. People grow into the conversations that you create around them. Yeah. So at some point I realized that there were certain things. So I've been in a lot of situations where I'm on the receiving end of youth intervention. When my mother was pregnant, she was being intervened on for social services because of my sister. And then all the way, I mean, like 18 years of intervention. And I know what it feels like in the adult child dyad to have an adult who doesn't understand that there are a ton of micro messages you're sending to a child every single second. And I think it's very often taken for granted that those interactions are inherently safe when in fact they're usually more problematic than we realize. Also, I know the power of mentors. I wouldn't be here today if not for the mentors who changed my life, Arthur being the very first one. So I wanted to do something to, to create a contribution where I had been helped. So I, I co-founded what's called the Arthur Project. And we bring mentors to middle school students in the Bronx. Uh, and a note about the Bronx. I was told that you get your education uh, and you escape those kinds of neighborhoods, right? And now I realize that that's a very toxic narrative. And I think, well, actually, I really like where I came from. And in fact, my t-shirt today <laughs> says in made in the Bronx. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm very, if you could see me, whoever's listening, right. I, I, I we'll do a picture. Just, just know that I have a t-shirt on that says made in the Bronx. And I think for a long time, I bought the narrative of escaping the bad place. Right. And then I was like, well, that's not right. You know, and I wanted to go back to where I came from and show gratitude and say, is it really success if it doesn't create opportunities for other people? Mm. Can you just get yours and it's all well, I don't think so because I came from somewhere. No one comes from nowhere. So I'm going to go back there. So we serve middle schoolers in the Bronx and we bring them mentors in a very different way. Instead of volunteer-based mentors, we have MSW students. So people who are studying to be social workers, these are emerging clinicians. And we put them in these extremely intensive relationships so that the child will have a mentor throughout all of middle school. They change mentors a couple of times for a reason that's beyond the scope of this conversation. But the idea is to have, uh, well, usually mentoring programs will give you maybe 30 hours of mentoring for the whole time. Ours, our kids get about 500 hours a year of mentoring. Wow. And our mentors have 100 hours a year of training so that we can create safety. And the overarching question is what is possible when you target a very vulnerable time in a child's life, middle school, the Bermuda Triangle of adolescence, <laughs> and, and you really come up under them with support to help them realize that they matter and support them academically to hit all their milestones, right? Can we get a deeper return on that investment in that child with a more intentional mentoring structure? So I'm doing that now absolutely because of what Arthur did for me, and I'm doing it where I'm doing it because I love where I come from. When you talk about creating change, to me it's always we, we get caught in the trap of trying to silver bullet and, and you know we're going to solve all these problems and we're going to help all these families, and yet you know you're a good example where it's one person at a time. Mm. You're helping one person at a time and you're pouring into them continually. So in other words, feeding them once, twice, helping them a little bit over here, helping them. No, it's, it's a lifetime process mm. or it's definitely a long-term process to where they can then move from one place in their life to the next. Talk about that philosophy, that idea when it comes to what you're doing with the Arthur Project and just how you see social change um, really created. What What is your philosophy around sure. that of helping one person and pouring in and what it ultimately takes to get someone where they want to go? Sure. Well, I mean, I like, I heard a couple of different angles of that question. I'm going to go with the yeah, initial Yeah, pick one. whichever one yeah, you want. Yeah, because you asked me about like kind of my take on <laughs> yeah, it, right? Yeah. And, th and I don't, I've never been asked that. So I just want to say thanks for asking that because so it, it's changed radically over the last few years, I would say. Uh, so I'm very often with people who... I, so I'm, I actually have like faith in humanity, just by the way. So I know a lot of people have gone to cynicism about the human race. Um, I think cynicism is the atrophy of your imagination. I think cynicism is the atrophy of your heart. Um, I, so I'm not cynical and I would never claim it for myself. I actually think people are really well intended. And this is going to go right to your question in a moment. But the problem is we don't realize our own limitations and vulnerabilities. 
we have the capacity, especially in this very interconnected world, to unintentionally um, hurt one another and do things that are selfish and we don't we don't know it, right? So I'm gonna go back to your question. The Arthur Project is a a central passion of my life. I love kids. I love middle schoolers. I don't care if anyone says, what do you talk? I love them. I love the hard time they give you. I love the searching that they're doing. Uh, but but social change overall, I think really, I used to believe that you would look for a problem somewhere out in the world. Okay, well, is there a country where I can build a school? <laughs> Can I give backpacks to these kids I've never met? That's all good. That's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But now I realize that each and every one of us, it, it, when we think that way, it's almost as though we, we forgive and remove our own lives from the problems that we see. I think we need to look at ourselves and say, okay, if you went back to when your alarm clock went off this morning and you cataloged your entire day and all the relationships in which you're a part of and your behaviors where am I doing things that maybe could be a little more problematic? And where is my life sort of loaning credence and agreement to things that may cause harm? And how can I, how can I change that? So I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, I quickly found out that I, you know, that there was in a sense currency for my message in rooms where I didn't necessarily agree with what was going on. And I've never spoken publicly about that. Not too much anymore. It'll be in the new book very much, but I was um, called on to speak for a fundraiser in a wealthy area in the South some years ago. And when I got to the space, they wanted me to talk about overcoming adversity and, you know, how you do that, right? So I got there and they were fundraising for a homeless shelter. So mind you, it was for a good cause. It was a country club also. There was lots of shrimp cocktail, very great Gatsby, big chandeliers. And I go in and I was told that they wanted to hear about, you know, my life transformed, right? So I didn't, I wrote all these index cards out and in one side I had, anecdotes, almost like stepping stones of mentors, teachers, community members who had helped me. On the other side, I had, you know, the choices I made, the determination, the what have you. And I like to improv a bit. So I was just going to glance and depending on the energy of the room, I'll pluck from one, I'll pluck from the other. Well, I'll tell you something, if you've never spoken in front of a room before, um, I, there's, there's something that we know as speakers, like that you may not know is that you can feel the energy from the room really clearly. And you can hear when something does not resonate and when it does. And if you're you know, good at what you do, you pivot, <laughs> right? So, so I'm standing there with this room full of folks who are very wealthy, quite conservative, and I'm noticing that nothing is resonating about the folks who helped me, very little. <laughs> you know, my teachers, my mentors to whom I loan, I, I give all the credit and also my work, right? But, but when I said things like choice, um, empowerment, you know, uh, bootstrap, right? That was like a hit. So I picked more from the cards on this other side. And then at the end, really almost nothing that I said about things like you need a strong community, you need mentors, you need structural change. Like that went silent. I got back into the taxi, right? And I was leaving and this man came up to me and like whacked me on the back like a congratulations said, you're the reason that poverty is not an obstacle. And he said, God bless America. <laughs> and I, I it, he might as well have just shown me like a ghost. I got, or I looked like a ghost. I was pale. I got back into the taxi and in one fist, I had the cards about systemic stuff and, and help and community. And the other fist I had, you know, you, you got to push yourself. And in a sense, that chasm and that gap, right? My life has been in the space between those things for so long. And what I've noticed is that uh, in my next book will be called The Weight of Two Worlds, A Bootstrapper's Love Letter to America. I don't believe in bootstrappers. <laughs> so let's go back to social change to your question. I used to think that I could just show up and hang out with those folks. And they were actually going to send backpacks to homeless children. Um, and that would be enough. But then I had to actually look at my life and my choices and my responsibility. Had I done really an honest job that day? Had I really taken responsibility to say, guys, poverty is an obstacle. And actually people are struggling. And we do need to talk systemic change. Guys, I was just told that that entire table, number nine over there, is in charge of most of the real estate in the town where this homelessness is such a problem. And maybe you're raising the rents and they're unaffordable and the families are homeless and now you're giving them backpacks. Can we talk about that, right? Like, so I was actually enabling the room to not talk about those deeper things. I say all that, Jeremy, to say this, you don't have to look very far to think about where to make change. <laughs> you know, you have to locate yourself in the yeah. change and, and, and the issues themselves. And if some of us, would make a commitment. If you, here's, here's how it goes now for me. If you have a problem with inequity, um, have inequity stop with you. 
<laughs> if you have a problem with, um, you know, poverty, don't do anything to help produce poverty. If you don't, if you have a problem with the environment, stop, stop doing things to it. Right. So I have a friend who's a marriage counselor. I'll sum it up like this. Cause they, he always makes me laugh. He says, you know, um, we're on to all you guys, marriage counselors. If you ever come in with your spouse and you're having an issue and we look at you and we have your number, we know that all you want us to do is like change your spouse. Like now we're going to do the work and change my spouse. But the real work can't begin until you go right here and point to yourself. And what I know now about social change is that the real, the boldest social change comes from people willing to locate themselves in the problems that they purport to solve. And that takes courage and you have to be unpopular and be willing to be unliked. And those are my heroes, the people willing to do that. Not as Father Greg Boyle says, not to point things out, but to point the way. And, you know, so now I see that I'm, I'm wrestling with at this stage of my life. I'm so proud of the Arthur Project. I'm so proud that I was able to take the problems in my life and the worst tragedies and not have that be the end of those stories, but that they continue and become something good. I'm so proud of that for this next phase of my life. I would be proud if I could be remembered, you know, for having had the courage to self-examine and and be willing to lose come what may, anything that comes with it and to say that guys, like we have to have an honest conversation about where we are in this country and until we look at ourselves, I don't think we'll be able to get there. I love that advice. One more question then we'll do a lightning round and kind of wrap up, but how does all of this play into you being a mother? Mm -hmm. and a wife. Well, I mean, thank you for asking that as well. You have, I, you, I've never, the series of questions you're asking me, people never ask quite like this. And I'm actually having a really good time with this. <laughs> it's great. Um, so a wife and a mother. So, you know, they're different. It's so different. So I'll, I'll say, I'll say wife first, right? So as my husband's partner in life, um, I have to have humility, right? So sometimes I'm just absolutely convinced in a certain mood that whatever just happened was all his fault. <laughs> and if only he would do this, everything would get better. You know, I'm sure no one knows what I'm talking well, about. So, right? yeah, I think that's yeah, like any yeah. married, <laughs> right. married couple. Can we uh, can all listen, relate to that? Yes. Right. If you would just this, then everything would that. Right. right? right, right. And I'm guilty. I'm going to Jeremy, I'm guilty. Right. And I've sat there. We and all I'm, are. Right. And then I'm like fixated of how I'm going to get him to do that. Thing, right. <laughs> 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 right. And, and my poor husband. Right. But he's done the same to me. Okay. To be fair. Um, right. But then to, to pause and say, oh, you know, um, <laughs> maybe this is maybe I'm more of a stereotype than I realized. Right. Maybe actually I'm that really angry wife at the moment who's not willing to think that I had anything to do with what was going on. My my mom used to take me to all these narcotics anonymous meetings because she had no child care and the kids all play in the back together and eat the donuts and they drink the juice. And and I used to laugh. All the kids would laugh at certain phrases. We didn't understand them. But now I understand. They used to say that what keeps people sick in life is to think that they're messed up in, in a very unique way. The breakthrough can happen when you realize you're just another bozo on the bus, right? And I laughed hard, but now I know as I'm looking at my husband that what I think I'm so right about, I'm actually just another bozo on the bus. And <laughs> I'm like, need to have the humility to say, I'm really sorry. And I, I love you more than I love being right. Yeah. So that's a big piece. With a, as being a mother, it's this is tough. Yeah, I have... A book written, you know, that I've, that I've written about my life. There's this movie. My children are, they're, you know, almost seven and eight and trying to figure out like who their mom is and why do all these people come talk to you all the time? And why did they stop you in the airport and want to take your picture? And why did that, you know, they don't, they're trying to understand the meaning of it. And they know who Arthur was. And my son's middle name is Arthur. And I, you know, they, they know about my background as much as they can. Where I'm challenged as a mom is to go back to your point is now how do I raise them so that they really are grateful for what they have and also take ownership? And I know that that will be a life's work, but there is one clue that has stood out to me as like the most important. Um, so I have a lot of friends who now they have means. I met them in college. They grew up wealthy and constantly their parents struggled with this. And now they're struggling as parents. My children have so much. How do I raise them to be grateful? How do I raise them to be grateful? And they ask these things. And I say, what do you try? They say, well, I take them to go give Thanksgiving meals away on Thanksgiving. I take them to visit the shelter to donate the toy. And what I would say to others is the same thing I say to myself, which is your children are brilliant. They're little detectives. And if you tell them all human beings are valuable, who's at your dinner table? Who do you call for advice? 
who do you have meaningful, mutually satisfying relationships with, right? And, and if you can point all around you and it's one type of person only and not a mixture, then you are actually communicating messages of some people being less through doing those things you think where you're teaching, you know, good things. So as a mom, I look to myself to live a life where my children are exposed to uh, networks of relationships with diverse bodies of people. And I think inherently, if they see me smile and light up when someone walks through the door, they'll know that that's a valuable human being because they're looking at me. Children look at adults the way that people look at flight attendants during turbulence. You know, <laughs> if you're okay, I'm okay. If you're okay, I'm okay. They're taking a cue from you. So, look, you know, before you go and take them to give a turkey away, who's at your dinner table? Who's in your family pictures, right? It's about the relationships that you value and what you value, they will value. So I try to live my life that way. Amazing. Uh, this is one of those conversations we could go on for hours. There's so much just wealth of knowledge and advice and lessons learned. Let's switch over though and do a lightning round. So just quick questions, quick answers. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing that kind of comes to mind, but um, you obviously are working on your second book. So I won't ask you about that necessarily, but give us another book, a, a recent book that you've read. Oh, sure. Uh, Winners Take All. Um, <laughs> it's a book about a man who just sort of says, you know, well, a lot of what I said today, you know, would we have to go solve a bunch of problems in philanthropy if we didn't make them to begin with? Oh, and Atomic Habits by James Clear, which I hands down would say, and I don't say this lightly, is one of the best books I've ever read. Nice. Yeah. What do you like to do to relax? Oh, um, hang out with anyone, a loved one of any kind, like hang out with my kids, hang out with people I love and go do anything at all. So what's a favorite vacation spot as a family? Um, Memphis, you know, <laughs> can, you not, can you not see where I am? Good Michael answer. Drake's house, Alice, Alice Drake's house. <laughs> um, Everyone's I'm, invited. I'm only partially kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to go anywhere that where my kids can run around and I can hear their laughter and play and they, they are received with joy and love. And, and actually it might be, <laughs> it actually might be Memphis, Jeremy. Like I really enjoy coming here and I hope I can spend chunks of time here even more so going forward. Yeah. So what do you and your husband like to do either as a date night or just a fun tradition or what's something that you two just, just like enjoy? we enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this routine that when the kids leave for school, usually it's, a lot of my routines involve coffee, but like I'll be making coffee and he'll be making some kombucha, something, whatever he does, all that hippy dippy stuff he likes. And we'll, <laughs> and I will find an article on a topic we both like. And while he's busy tinkering with something, I, I read to him. And then we talk about issues going on in the world. And then we also just watch ridiculous movies together. And we, I laugh more with him than with almost anyone. So yeah, we like to read articles to each other and, and make each other laugh and talk about issues going on in the world. I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. What's a favorite quote or a quote that inspires you? Wow. Uh, don't let what you cannot do interfere with what you can do. Coach John Wooden. Yeah. What is a bit of advice because obviously you on the Arthur project, you are running a business, you're running a nonprofit. Um, what's your, what's a bit of advice you would give to an entrepreneur in terms of going out and following their dream? Wow. Uh, it better be something you really care about. <laughs> I would never compare a nonprofit to a business, not me personally, but whatever it is, it is going to require you to refuse so many things that you could be doing with your time you're going to be out with your kids and they're going to say, can you come with me someplace? And you're going to have to say, I cannot today. It better be meaningful because you're going to trade a lot of things for it. And when you really, really mean it, you'll wake up extra early. You'll push that much harder because it's something you can give your whole heart to. Very true. So if we are going to visit the Bronx, mm -hmm. uh, where should we go? Give us some of your favorite places or things to do. Are we going for like pizza? Are we going to yeah. the, wherever for anyone who's, yeah. you know, going to travel to the New York area, where should we go? I mean, I always get, people are asking, where can I go eat in the Bronx? So I'm going to go with food. I'm very food motivated personally. So I would recommend Italian food on Arthur Avenue at a place called Dominic's. <laughs> I'm seeing like everything is sort of whatever else is in the city, but then the food is the center for me. <laughs> so, so I would encourage there. And I think Van Cortlandt Park is beautiful for hiking trails. Um, and I think we have a lot of rich history, you know, so, but I'm going to say Dominic's for Italian food uh, is a must if you're in New York City. Give us a favorite present, and it can be that your parents gave you, it could be your husband, it could be anybody, just a favorite gift you've ever received. Wow. Um, my mother gave me 
when I was 11, a Narcotics Anonymous coin, you know, when you're sober so many days, they give you the coin if you make a certain amount of time. She wasn't actually sober. Uh, someone else gave it to her. Actually, a drug dealer gave it to her when she was trying to sell, I think, our toaster or something. But she, she anyway, she brought, it, she brought it home. And I thought it was a gold coin from a treasure chest. I didn't know what was going on. But she handed it to me. And then I realized that when I was in those meetings with her, that was the prayer. Because it has a serenity prayer on it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I didn't know what that meant, but I kept that coin forever. I kept it when I was on the streets and had nowhere to live. I kept it when I was having a struggle in my marriage that we ultimately overcame and became closer than ever. I kept it when I had my children and I feared for so many things in life for them. And what it reminds me of is not only that connection with my mother, but there's only so much I can do. And I have to know where my work is and then where God's work is after that. You kind of answered it before with the legacy question, but what you're, you're obviously working on your legacy every single day, but you know, many, many, many years from now, what do you hope that people say about Liz Murray and the difference you were able to make with your life? Hmm. Well, if you know, for me and sorry to be so nitpicky, but it always depends on the person, right? So I have to say that the, those who knew me, at least in the immediate after uh, that I was kind, that would be one of the most important things to me. And then if there were someone was reading about me in a book, <laughs> um, I would want them to, to especially my second book that I'm coming out with, which I am terrified to publish, uh, that I had the courage to do and speak up for what was right. And that I put that over my own self-interest. And I had the courage to to use my life as an instrument to make things better and make that more important even than myself. Um, and that we, and as an example, so that others could say, and this is why, and I'll just say the, this last little piece, whatever way the world is, my dad was right, by the way, guys, as he was digging through the trash, like it's all made up, right? <laughs> but if we all could hit a button today and reset and erase everyone's memory, we wouldn't even know why we're hurting each other so much, why there's so much poverty and why some people, so many people have so much and so many people have so little, we wouldn't know why all those things were happening. There would be a new mindset, which is to say every day, the way the world is, is held together by agreements. It's the agreement that I make with you that the world is that way. And the one you make with me, and it goes and it recreates every day. Um, that means that it can change <laughs> and that there is power in your agreement and your vote for things to be that way. So I would hope that my work, that I have evolved to a place where I could say, guys, it doesn't have to be this way. And I'm willing to show you that you can actually do the right thing and, and survive anyway and speak out and that others would realize the power that they have, that they matter and they can do the same in their own way. So how can listeners stay in touch? What's an easy way, obviously kind of follow uh, for the second book when it comes out, where should we go? What should we do? What should be on the lookout in terms of how to just kind of follow this conversation forward? Sure. I mean, the arthurproject.org is a place you can always find me. My email address is on there, lmurray at the arthurproject.org if you want to directly get in touch. But I would say stay tuned for The Weight of Two Worlds. And I'm really excited where that will go. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. Well, Liz Murray, you are a change maker. It's one of those, uh, an honor to have you on this podcast, but thank you for all you do. And thank you for coming on the change makers podcast. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Thank you for listening to the change makers podcast produced by city current and brought to you by Lipscomb and Pitts insurance to learn more about our guests and share your stories of others leading by example, visit us online at citycurrent.com or follow us on social media using at city current. Please make sure to subscribe, rate and review our podcast wherever you listen. Now think big, start small and act now be a change maker.